Distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Sabiha Isak, and I'm chairperson of the Global Respiratory Infection Partnership and the South African Research Chair on Antibiotic Resistance and One Health at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in Durban, South Africa. Welcome to this regional workshop to develop the European Roadmap for AMR Action by Pharmacy. I'm really very honored to share this platform with Professors Philip Howard and Elsa Lopez Pinto. A little bit more about my co-facilitators. Professor Philip Howard is president of the British Society of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy, a consultant pharmacist in antimicrobials at the Leeds Teaching Hospital NHS Trust, and honorary visiting professor at Leeds University. He's a member of the UK Department of Health Advisory Group on AMR and Healthcare Associated Infections and the National Institute of Health and, of Health and Care Excellence, or NICE, Common Infections Guidelines Group. <clears throat> His research interests include uh, antimicrobial stewardship and antibiotic shortages. He led the first global hospital antimicrobial stewardship survey and has been involved in AMS education and training across the world. Elsa Lopez Pinto is assistant professor in pharmacy and pharmaceutical technologies at University Miguel, Miguel Hernandez, Hernandez sorry, at Elche in Alicante. Her research activity focuses on quantifying, analyzing, and interpreting the health results generated by pharmaceutical interventions carried out at different levels of pharmaceutical care. She's also a member of the European Innovation Partnership on Adherence and Healthy Aging. So I will begin with a brief overview of the workshop objectives. Philip and Elsa will then facilitate an interactive session to develop the, the European Roadmap for AMR Action by Pharmacy. I will end the workshop with an overview of the next steps. So these regional workshops, six in total, build on the global session we held on September 12th, Saturday last week, the recording of which is available on the FIP website together with other webcasts and videos should you not have been able to attend the 12th September workshop. Just to say that the recording of this workshop will also be available on the FIP website immediately after this event. So you're welcome to share it amongst your colleagues in pharmacy. The objective of this regional workshop is to work together to drive regional AMR uh, initiatives by translating policy into action. During this workshop, we will co-develop and make a commitment to a regional roadmap for AMR success in pharmacy in the European region. GRIP is really honored to partner with the International Pharmacy Federation to drive AMR action in a new decade with leadership from pharmacy. So why pharmacists? To answer this, I want to draw on the pentagonal framework of the Global Respiratory Infection Partnership. This framework speaks to the role of policy, prescribers, pharmacists, and patients on the prevention of antimicrobial resistance. So let us go through each of these five Ps. The first is policy endorsed by the local governments and clinical communities of practice that advance antibiotic stewardship and conservation. The second speaks to patient empowerment that and, and, and education about appropriate use, symptomatic treatment options. It includes pharmacists, stewardship role as educators, providing patients with advice and support on infection management and when to consult a doctor. It also includes prescribed guidance on antibiotic st stewardship and effective dialogue with patients. And finally, patients and effect behavior change in terms of patient demand for antibiotics. They are critical to the implementation of policy as well as the generation of policy to inform, to inform policy related interventions and pharmacists prevent antibiotic resistance by impacting on prescribing practice, patient behavior and policy implementation. Sorry, I, I
We seem to have lost Sabiha there for a moment. Um, can I suggest, Erin, that yep. we move on to Philip's slides, please? My apologies, colleagues. Um, Phil, have you filled in? I'm so, I'm so sorry about that. This no, no. If we if we go back to the slides that you were on, I think we can catch up, please. Yes, that one. Thank you very much. I'm I'm re really sorry about this. I'm going to switch off. Um, Erin, are we back on the? Yes, my apologies. So just to continue. Um, that's fine. So you will recall from the workshop on the 12th that we, we decided to focus on three of the five strategic objectives of the Global Action Plan on AMR that resonate most with the policy and practice roles of the pharmacists. These were to improve awareness and understanding of AMR through effective communication, education, and training, to uh, reduce the incidence of infection through effective sanitation, hygiene, and infection prevention measures, and to optimize the use of antimicrobial medicines. And we spoke about this in the context of the COMB framework and that each of these initiatives could take an education policy or public health perspective. So a little more about the COMB model. Um, we, we also wanted to incorporate the COMB model because we believe that pharmacists have immense capability, opportunity and motivation to prevent, contain, and mitigate AMR. Pharmacists have the capability to address AMR because they have the knowledge, skills, abilities, and proficiencies acquired by education and practice. They are, uh, uh, they have the, they are, made, they are motivated to prevent, contain, and mitigate AMR as a, as a global public health threat and they have the opportunity to achieve this by leveraging country commitments to the UN declaration and the pharmacy association's commitment to the FIP policy statement on AMR. So regional initiatives can address education, policy, or public health in any of these three strategic objectives of the Global Action Plan. So now we come to question time and the interactive part of this workshop. Our very first question is, has your country approved a national action plan? For those of you that are intimately involved with antimicrobial resistance, you will recall that the World Health Assembly took a decision that all countries would have national action plans in place by May 2017. While a number of countries have developed these action plans, there are still several countries that are in development and even more countries that are having quite a number of implementation challenges especially now that health resources or health systems resources have been refocused onto the COVID pandemic. So it is really imperative that we, we ensure that AMR re remains high on the public health agenda, both in our countries and globally. So let's see what the results are. Great, more than 77, well, 77% of you are aware that your country has a national action plan. That's not unusual. If you look into the library of national action plans, you will see that um, the, the, the European region has a large number of countries that have already developed and, and have started implementing these as well. So just 14% said no. Let us continue with the, with the next slide, please. The, the next question is, of all of these national action plans, is the role of pharmacy clearly defined in the plan? So has the pharmacy sector been identified as key implementers or key role players in this plan? So for those of you that answered yes, can we please have a yes, no, or I don't know to this question? So is the role of pharmacy clearly defined in your national action plan on antimicrobial resistance? In my experience, um, lots of the uh, ministries are, are identified and not so much each healthcare professional. So just a little under half uh, of the national action plans, which is really excellent, have defined a role of pharmacy 
Um, but a third say no, and well, about 20% of you say that you don't know. So this is really, uh, it's really heartening to say, to see almost 50% of national action plans identifying pharmacy as a key role player and a stakeholder. So that's great. So the next slide. So we want to populate the slide with as many initiatives as possible, after which we will determine timeframes and responsible entities. I'm now going to hand over to Philip and Elsa to take us through the uh, initiatives that will be applicable to the European region. Over to you, Elsa and Philip. Morning, everybody. Uh, so I'm Philip Howard. So one of the things that we did before um, we started to pull together some initiatives that we want to discuss during this webinar uh, was send a survey out. And so the results here are from uh, the global um, the global responses um, to that survey. And what the survey showed was that almost half of respondents were unaware or not actioning the objectives outlined for the global action plan on antimicrobial resistance. And within the survey, there were five key barriers um, identified. So the first of those was education and training. Ongoing education and robust training modules and implementing AMR uh, mitigation strategies for pharmacy in local settings is lacking. This is causing a disconnect between global objectives and operational execution. The second barrier was around financial resources and institutional support. And despite uh, national and global action plans, AMR is still not considered an urgent health concern for many governments. And consequently, public expenditure on antimicrobial um, resistance mitigation strategies is deprioritized leaving pharmacy with poor institutional support and little funding to address the issue. The third barrier was around recognition and collaboration. And globally, there is a lack of acknowledgement of pharmacy and its association with uh, patient outcomes. And as such, there is an overestimation of doctors' capabilities uh, in antimicrobial resistance mitigation, resulting in a lack of motivation for collaborations between pharmacy, doctors, hospitals, academics, and policy makers. The fourth barrier was around accountability and leadership. And there's a clear lack of accountability regarding the implementation and monitoring of antimicrobial resistance strategies, and this is causing a gap in leadership. This is in generating local ambiguities and low levels of commitment to furthering global and national objectives. And then finally, the last barrier is around regulation and surveillance. There's little regulatory practices and a lack of robust policy frameworks for antibiotic prescribing, and this has created a barrier for curbing inappropriate antibiotic use. Poor encouragement to increase surveillance from regulatory bodies creates issues with reuse, sharing, and improper disposal of antibiotics among patients. Well, I'll hand over to Elsa now. Okay, thank you, Philip, and good morning to everyone. Um, firstly, I would like to thank Rafe and Philip and Ervi uh, for inviting me to co chair uh, this workshop with my colleague Philip. I am excited to be here. I think that uh, this workshop is an excellent way to decide the roadmap for AMR success in pharmacy because this will ha happen taking into account the opinions and ideas of all the attendees, pharmacists and other partners who are committed to antibiotic stewardship and rational antibiotic use in the different countries of our region. Okay, so let's continue with the presentation. Here we can see some quotes from the survey. The first quote came from Great Britain and says that many countries have action plans but accountability for key sections can be lacking. Where this is not specific, there is poor progress. This second quote comes from Spain and says that the lack of institutional support for patient-centered activities in the pharmacy setting is a relevant barrier and impacts on pharmacist motivation. 
The last one comes from Switzerland and said that what is needed is an AMR framework with the competencies of pharmacies, which can be delivered to the government and to the politicians to convince them that the pharmacies can contribute largely to meeting the goals. Okay, I fully agree with these quotes, and I hope that some of the initiatives that we are going to present today could help to break down these barriers. You probably have other comments, so feel free, free to share with us via chat or Q&A. Thank you, go next slide. Okay, so uh, taking into account the result of the survey, we have developed this key initiative that sits in the key action areas for pharmacy, that are education, policy, and public health. These initiatives are aligned with the strategic objective of the Global Action Plan on AMR that Savi has just explained, and I'm going to remind you. The strategic objectives are the following, improving awareness and understanding of AMR through effective communication, education, and training, reducing the incidence of infection through effective sanitation, hygiene, and infection prevention measures, and finally, optimize the use of antimicrobial medicines. Now, Philip and me as co-facilitators are going to give you a brief explanation of each of the initiatives that we have prepared. The execution of these initiatives could differ between countries depending on the available resources and the specific situation of each country. That is why at the end of the presentation of each initiative, we will ask you to poll when you think each initiative could be implemented by in your country. So I'm going to start off with our first initiative. So Elsa and I have got together, um, looked at the results of the survey and um, spoken to some of our contacts uh, around Europe and come up with six initiatives. Now, these are just suggestions and we're really keen that um, after we've gone through these that you use the chat box to um, help develop some of the roadmap by putting maybe some other ideas in which you think are perhaps a higher priority in there. So we're going to start off by looking at uh, improving awareness and understanding of AMR through uh, effective communication, education and training. Now, the first one initiative is around creating a global repository of open access materials uh, related to pharmacy and antimicrobial resistance. Um, and it's really important that we actually have these in multiple languages available for everybody to use. Unfortunately, so many things are written in English uh, and not translated into um, other languages to help the pharmacists to actually communicate with people um, locally. And one of the things we were really important, we thought was really important, is actually having um, the role of evidence-based symptomatic sort of relief. And our plan is actually to pull together um, all these resources um, from FIP and the Global Respiratory Infection Partnership and other partners such as WHO, REACT and British Society of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy. And there are plenty of others uh, to bring all these resources into a single place to try and help anybody. And so I've just put in the chat book now um, a few links to um, infection leaflets um, in 24 different languages and, and a range of courses out there and there'll be some others that will come on there and I'll hand back to Elsa. Oh sorry before we do, um, could we have a vote on how quickly this initiative could be implemented um, uh, well in your country so how quickly do you think you could help to um, submit um, um, open access materials in, in your own sort of language into our central repository. And you'll see the years there, 2021, 2022, 2023, or 2024 onwards. So if you could vote, please. Philip, can we um, also speak a little bit about how, we, how people can access all of these materials? Um, you, you speak about open access, free access, et cetera. So would they have to, um, request permission or is it just freely available on the websites? No, I think it's really important that um, 
that all of these things are freely available and people don't have to ask permission to um, amend them for their own country. They're able to take them, open access, um, if it's education materials, put their own logos on. Um, and if it's courses, they must be free to use at the point of entry um, and elsewhere. So we've got some results in. And so um, it's roughly split between probably uh, 2021, which is, is probably those who've already got something ready and can easily sort of um, put it, and, and 2022. Um, so it might take a year or so before we've sort of got there. And I think this is really important because what this means is, is fairly quickly we can start to develop a repository of um, information materials and courses in multiple languages that we can actually get our pharmacists to start using. So that's a really positive start on here. I'll hand over to Elsa now for the second one. Okay, thank you, Philip. The second initiative uh, we want to share is to include in the pharmacy and technicians CPD and core curricula training on the role of pharmacies as antibiotic stewards to include drivers of patient demand where inappropriate prescribing happens, in example, upper respiratory tract infections, URTIs, and to manage patient expectations. URTIs are one of the most common reasons for consulting in primary care and in the community pharmacy setting. As you know, most acute URTIs are self-limiting and viral, so don't respond to antibiotics, and most guidelines don't recommend them at in first instance. Despite this, inappropriate prescribing for respiratory infections continues to be widespread, Moreover, DPS and pharmacies feel under pressure to prescribe and dispense antibiotics when they are not indicated. Moreover, this situation has become especially relevant during this pandemic. At least in Spain, we have detected an increase in the prescription of antibiotics, such as acetromycin, for prevention in suspected COVID-19 patients. At the same time, we have good news in this pandemic, pharmacies have become a key healthcare professional, being the first option for citizens instead of going to the primary care center. So our vision is that we have the opportunity now to establish pharmacy staff as a benchmark for citizens in correct antibiotic use and management and on the prevention of AMR. To be a benchmark for citizens means that pharmacy's target will not only be patient in antibiotic treat will not be only patient in antibiotic treatment, but people in every stage of life, such as um, women, the dumb, uh, or chronic patients. So the CPD that we propose in this initiative should focus on training pharmacies on the management of minor ailments and self-limiting conditions as well as in patient expectations. That means how to deal with incorrect patient beliefs and behaviors in relation to the use of antibiotics. Put simple, how to educate and convince a patient with professional arguments that an antibiotic is not the solution in his case and that there are other options for the symptomatic treatment of his problem. So uh, please, um, uh, Carol, can you put the, the pool, please? Okay. So uh, now you have to decide. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, by when uh, could this initiative be implemented in your country? I remind you the initiative to include in the pharmacy and technician CPD and core curricular training on the role of pharmacists as antibiotic stewards. So what do you think? Do you think this uh, initiative uh, would be can be implemented in 2021, 2022, 2023, or 2024 onwards. Mm, okay. Probably uh, in, 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 some can, in, any, in some countries you have this, uh, this initiative implemented. Probably no, so we are going to see this now. Okay, so here are the results. Okay, 34% um, of you think that uh, you, we can have this initiative implemented in, 
uh, next year in 2021 and uh, okay uh, 13 percent in 20, 20, 2022 and 31 percent in 2023 so there are some um, different uh, opinion i think uh, in my opinion this initiative is not difficult to implement uh, we uh, should have the support of uh, pharmacies associations and the general councils and of course uh, this initiative should be provided by FIP collaboration so uh, okay in any case it's good news if we have this initiative implemented in 2024 the next initiative that we've got is all around uh, reducing the incidence of, inf of infection um, by uh, prevention measures now, one of the things that FIP has been really strong about over many years is the role of pharmacists and uh, pharmacies um, in vaccinating uh, patients. And one of the initiatives we want to call on is really to try and see that expanded much further. And so what we want to have as an initiative is that countries include pharmacies as partners in vaccination programmes um, with roles which can range from the promotion um, of prevention, counselling, detection of population at risk to the administration of vaccines depending on each country's legislation. And ideally, ultimately, we'd like to move towards having all um, pharmacies able to actually vaccinate people. And I think this is particularly important at the moment. We're suffering um, from the COVID pandemic at the moment. And when a vaccine, a vaccine, an effective vaccine is discovered, we will need as many people as possible to help sort of vaccinate uh, the at-risk sort of populations in there. And I think pharmacies really have a key role here. So what I'd like you to do is uh, vote on how, what year you think we could actually uh, bring this in uh, within your country. And whilst you're doing your sort of voting, um, I hope many of you have had the opportunity to actually uh, join some of the FIP um, vaccination um, sort of sessions that have been going on through um, the virtual sort of Congress at the moment, because uh, I think it's one of the real strengths of FIP um, on here. So hopefully we'll have some results coming sort of soon. So that's really good to see. So um, in terms of vaccination, the, uh, the uh, highest bit is in 40% um, uh, in the year sort of 2021, and then equal of 23% between 2022 and 2023. Um, and so it shows we've probably got um, just under half who are probably um, already there or very close there. And that's good news, but I think there's still a lot of work to be done on this because vaccination is one of the biggest uh, effective interventions we can have for actually preventing infections in the first place and therefore um, uh, preventing the need for antibiotics to be prescribed either appropriately or inappropriately, uh, which will drive resistance. So I will, we will move on to um, the next one, which I'll hand back to Elsa. Okay, thank you, Philip. Uh, the following initiative we want to share with you uh, are aligned to the Global Action Plan objective of optimizing the use of antimicrobial medicines. The first initiative is uh, that in their national action plans, countries include a monitoring plan of the rational use of the antibiotic dispensing community pharmacists, as well as the development of programs for optimizing the use of antibiotics PROA at community pharmacy setting. Okay, um, Sabiha has asked you at the beginning of this uh, workshop if your country has approved uh, a national action plan on antibiotics and if the pharmacy role was uh, clearly defined. Uh, most of you have answered yes, we have a, um, a national action plan uh, in my country, so this is uh, good news. Um, but uh, the role of the pharmacy, in your opinion, uh, was uh, clearly defined only for 36% of you and the rest of the case, you don't know, or the, or the role of the pharmacist is not clearly defined. The fact is uh, that uh, in Europe, most countries have approved 
approve a national action plans, which in many cases include the implementation of programs for optimizing the use of antibiotics, PROA, but at hospital level. You can see an example of this in the Spanish case study that you have in the pre-read documentation. Development of these PROAs together with the activities inherent to the program as well as institutional support has led to the implementation of some form of antibiotic stewardship in 70% of hospital, of Spanish hospitals. So in our opinion, and this is the aim of this initiative, these PROAs are also needed at community pharmacy level, as this is where the majority of antibiotics are dispensed. So the inclusion in national action plans of PROA programs at community pharmacy level represents the institutional support to pharmacists. At the same time, PROAs who serve us as infrastructure from which to drive action that include the rational use of antibiotics. So the second part of this initiative is to launch as a part of the PROA program in community pharmacy setting of a monetary plan of the rational use of antibiotics dispensed in community pharmacies where its antibiotic will be dispensed through a standardized compulsory, compulsory protocol. This protocol should be a step-by-step -step guide for dispensing antibiotics, including a checklist for the validation of the prescription, practical instructions to patients on how to take the, the antibiotics, and finally, once the antibiotic is dispensed, a follow-up of the core use and compliance by the patient. In my opinion, the implementation of this two by one initiative, the development of PROA programs at community pharmacy level, and the implementation of the monitoring plan of dispensed antibiotic could promote behavior change in antibiotic dispensing practice and could contribute to consolidate the role of community pharmacies in AMR. So please, uh, Cara, can you put the, the poll? And uh, now uh, the question by when could this initiative be implemented in your country? I remind you that the initiative is to monitor and plan the rational use of the antibiotic dispense in community pharmacies and development of, pro of programs for optimizing the use of antibiotics PROAS as community pharmacy in the community pharmacy setting. So please, uh, Poole, what do you think uh, this uh, initiative uh, could be implemented by in 2021, 2022, 2023, or, to 20, or 2024 onwards? Okay, I think, uh, okay, here we have the results. Most of you think that this, uh, this initiative uh, would be implemented in 2022, uh, and some of you in 2021. Uh, I think th these results are uh, quite optimistic, at least in Spain. I think this initiative uh, is, is probably the most difficult to achieve, but at the same time is the most relevant, in my opinion, for. Uh, improving the role of pharmacies in AMR. I, th I think it's the more difficult to achieve uh, because uh, uh, a change in policy is needed to to obtain the, the, to implement this these pro programs in the community pharmacy settings. But uh, at the same time, we have the mirror of the hospital pharmacy, and I think it's a good idea to replicate this in the community pharmacy setting. Thank you. Excuse me. <laughs> the next initiative is, is also mine uh, because it's quite connected to the last one. And uh, I think um, the next initiative uh, that we want to, to present is that countries carry out an epidemiological study to evaluate the clinical, humanistic, and economic impact of the plan of the rational use of antibiotic dispense in community pharmacies. Uh, okay, I think this is an interesting point. It, it is not enough to just implement the plan. We should demonstrate the added value of pharmacies interventions in AMR 
to do this, uh, we should uh, evaluate and disseminate uh, the clinical, humanistic, and economic results of the plan and demonstrate that with a structured program, appropriate tools, and institutional support, pharmacies have a leadership role in antibiotic stewardship. So please, uh, uh, can we put the pool? Okay, thank you. Uh, so please pull this initiative. When do you think this initiative could be implemented by in your country? Uh, um, in 2021, 2022, 2023, or 2024 onwards. Uh, okay, we have to wait 10 seconds and then we will see the, the results. I think it's uh, very important, uh, this key. Sometimes, uh, community pharmacies and in general we make uh, a lot of research, we part participate in research programs or make uh, uh, research in pharmacy in different uh, pharma pharmacies field but then uh, they don't re register their results or, or they don't disseminate it and so we don't know uh, that uh, this study or these results are uh, present. Okay, we have the results uh, here. Okay, I think uh, these results are uh, quite realistic. Uh, most of you uh, think that this initiative will be implemented in 2022, 23, or 24 onwards. Um, this initiative uh, depends on the last one. So I think we first have to implement the plan and then we have to design the, the study. Uh, in order to evaluate the, the, the results. So uh, I think the, the, your answers are very uh, realistic, 2023, 2024 onwards. Okay, so our final initiative around uh, optimizing the use of antimicrobial medicines um, is to mandate a national awareness raising campaign held every year during World Antibiotic Awareness Week. So that's uh, the week around the 18th of November each year. And to try and get pharmacists and pharmacy technicians um, to sign up to be um, antibiotic stewards or guardians, but almost be protectors of antibiotics. And we'd hope to see alongside that um, targeted sort of campaigns at different, um, um, different patient groups targeting on uh, particular aspects which will resonate with them of why it's really important that we must look after sort of antibiotics. Now in the chat, um, whilst you're voting, um, I've just put um, a couple of examples um, on there. So there's a multinational program uh, already um, called the Antibiotic Guardian uh, campaign. So you'll see antibioticguardian.com. And then in my city, in the north of um, England, we've actually built on that by uh, using the Antibiotic Guardian, but actually tailoring it very much towards a city approach. And we've called it seriously resistance to try a bit of, bit of humor in there. And so you can certainly um, sort of uh, have a look at some of those ideas. But I know certainly around the world already, um, they already have this um, active role um, within many countries during World Antibiotic Awareness Week, but we're keen to really make sure we get all uh, pharmacists and pharmacy technicians really engaged in all of this. So let's see what the results show. And so the results show, thankfully, um, that 54% uh, already have, um, um, probably have some sort of campaign sort of going or can start it sort of really uh, really quickly about being antibiotic sort of stewards and targeting different populations uh, and then the smaller amounts we will need to try and sort of work on so i think that's quite good for a real sort of st um, start sort of on here so what we're going to do now is um we've had various um sort of um ideas on the sort of the chat and we're really after your sort of feedback on some of our initiatives uh, uh, whether you think actually they're really sort of useful or there are some other ones you think actually we should really sort of include these. So what we're going to do first of all uh, on your screen is actually ask you to vote 
what you think are the three most important initiatives that will impact for your country. So if you could vote for three of those. Um, and so uh, you can see um, there are six um, sort of options on there. Uh, and we are after um, you for um, um, voting for your sort of top three. And this will help to help us prioritise what we're going to be um, building into the roadmap for Europe. The roadmap, whilst it will maybe pick on so the three and the other ones, isn't written in stone. It's going to be, have to something that we keep on um, developing over a period of time. But it's really important that we have pharmacists on the ground who are working with patients, as well as those working with national organisations, setting policy um, and the direction to work together to help us set out the roadmap and that we can actually end up um, uh, delivering what's in the global uh, AMR National Action Plan and our own national uh, AMR um, action plans. So here we go. So what is the top one? So the top one on here is uh, including the role of pharmacy um, and technicians for CPD and core curricula in the training in there with 70%. Yes. So that's very strong message around um, the yes. education. And then the second one and the third one are very sort of close in there, uh, which are around um, um, having a plan for monitoring uh, the rational use of antibiotics dispensed in community pharmacy and coming up with mm -hmm. a program to optimize the use um, of those um, antibiotics that are prescribed uh, in the community pharmacy setting. And if you, if you were there on Saturday, I showed an example of this from the UK where we'll be doing some work with a checklist and how a positive impact of challenging um, a GP based upon talking to the patient and knowing what they've had before. And then the third one is around having uh, pharmacies and partners in sort of vaccination sort of programs. Um, so that's really good feedback, um, which is sort of really helpful. Just, sorry, can I just put one little uh, blurb here for the uh, for GRIP's publication on community pharmacists as natural stewards for antimicrobial uh, antimicrobial stewardship? There's a paper that has been published, and, and we're going to put it up on the chat. But we really start we interrogate how the community pharmacists can play a key role in antimicrobial stewardship and mitigating resistance. Ashton will put that up on the on the chat as a link as well. So thank you. Sorry for interrupting. Please go ahead. So what we'd like you to just sort of do now is um, either use the chat function or the Q&A function uh, to really share some of your ideas uh, and then we'll be able to sort of um, take questions for a, a short period of time before we end up having to sort of wrap up. So over to all of you now. So uh, thank you very much. And, and my video is switched off because of connectivity issues. I've got a number of questions that I've been pulling out from the chat as well as the Q&A uh, uh, section. I've answered many of these as I can, but I think that some of them are really important for us to discuss uh, together with, the, with, the, with you and, and, and Elsa Philip. So the first, the first one speaks to the fact that we uh, used uh, that, that CPD was identified as a key initiative or one of the, the top of the, the top three, and the idea here is is to really think about um, without ex without uh, um, divulging my age. When I studied pharmacy, I had one lecture on antimicrobial resistance in one course over the four years of my study. And that was because anti there was always a company that was developing a new antibiotic. So if this one stopped working, we had another one, and that was the global age of antibiotics. So can you speak a little bit about CPD and upskilling us old people in antimicrobial resistance and, and stewardship? And I'm speaking only about myself here, Philip. Yes, well, uh, being a similar age, if not a lot older than you, um, I was also from the golden era of antibiotics before they started disappearing. I think an awful lot of countries um, have actually pulled together uh, CPD programs for all pharmacists, whether they practice in uh, the community, hospitals, uh, management, um, or sort of in sort of academia. Um, for some of those countries where they don't have a, um, access to some of those resources, 
we really want to try and use this global repository um, to um, have a, a series of sort of uh, CPD opportunities uh, in multiple languages to allow people to uh, engage in some of these. Now, some country um, um, national pharmaceutical societies have really been far thinking and they've built in to their CPD requirements for all pharmacists that they would actually um, have antimicrobial resistance as one of the things for, uh, for uh, that particular sort of year on there and ideally sort of each year. And I think within uh, FIP, because we actually have all the leaders um, in the world of pharmacy here, they really have the potential power to make that happen. And I would call upon those leaders of the national societies to work with policymakers to actually get CPD brought in um, as a uh, mandated um, element to keep people up to date, irrespective of their age. Young people like you and me, Sabia, um, or some of those really young people with all that knowledge. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Philip. Um, I, also, Elsa, would you like to add to that before I move yes. to the next question? Sure. Uh, okay. go ahead. No, I would like to say that I agree with Philip, of course. And uh, I think that uh, we should improve the training of undergraduate students on AMR. Uh, I think that all, although most pharmacy curriculum already include AMR as a learning outcome in, in subjects focused on antibiotics and the pharmacy degrees such as macrobiology or pharmacology, the concept uh, is being taught in isolation. And in general, the concept of antibiotic stewardship is not explicitly established. So um, I think we should create an AMR integrated curriculum uh, in AMR, uh, focus on the role of pharmacists uh, as antibiotic stewards, by included in the pharmacy degree specific learning objectives in subjects with a professional approach, such as pharmaceutical care, health psychology, clinical pharmacy, or, or public health. Um, I think this would allow undergraduates to integrate the multiple dimensions of the concept and to acquire knowledge, skills, and abilities in antibiotic stewardship transversally throughout the pharmacy curriculum. And I think uh, this is a key point that we should consider it in the universities. That's an excellent just, point. Uh, Sabia, if I could just uh, so build on that. I think one of the things that's really important that Elsa uh, brings up there is we should get learning together. So that's learning, having the pharmacists integrated with doctors and nurses so they learn around yeah. um, the yes. optimal use of antibiotics together. So they're, they're used to actually working with pharmacists, offering advice on um, how they can actually improve their prescribing and not feel threatened if a pharmacist rings them up to offer advice about using a different strategy for a patient with infection. And I think if we can embed that at a really early age in the professions, it means as they then move through their careers, um, they realize that everyone's working together rather than against each other. And that it's not a threatening type of activity. That's a real, the two key takeaways there, Philip and Elsa, is the interprofessional nature of antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial stewardship and how important learning together is with other healthcare professionals. But also importantly, within the pharmacy curriculum, AMR and AMS should not be a silo standalone section, but rather integrated into the various aspects of pharmacology, pharmacy practice, public health, et cetera. Excellent. So in keeping with that and in keeping with the stewardship aspect and specifically in terms of community pharmacy, we had one question related to the difficulties some pharmacists have in some countries trying to determine the appropriateness of antibiotic prescriptions because they do not have access to the clinical history of the patient. Just to give you a, a quick synopsis of what happens in South Africa, we have ICD-10 codes which have to be inserted into prescriptions so we know what the diagnosis is. What are your thoughts for the European uh, region? I, I don't think it's particularly difficult. Uh, I don't work often in community pharmacy as I used to, but if a patient comes in with a prescription for an antibiotic and it doesn't tell me what the prescription's for, 
it's quite easily just to say to the patient, oh, do you mind if I ask you what um, you're actually taking this uh, antibiotic for? And so you can get an idea um, uh, early on about what it's the, the treatment's being used for. One of the, um, the pilot studies that we've done uh, within the UK, so the Royal Pharmaceutical Society developed this antibiotic checklist, um, which um, I discussed further. And then mm. through a, a research group has developed even further on with a questionnaire, which allows the patient to tell you what they're actually being treated for, but also allows you to um, uh, them to identify what their their knowledge is already around antibiotics on there. So I think there are very easy ways to do this. We just have to start talking to patients. Um, whilst having codes on prescriptions would be ideal, mm. I think there are easy ways around it. It's all about communication. Yeah, yeah. of course I agree with uh, with Philip, but and um, but I agree with this uh, with this uh, question. The prescription uh, validation uh, is uh, difficult to, to make without having uh, the access to the, to the history of the patient. We can ask patients about his uh, situation, but the, the risk of making mistakes is high. And I think this is, um, this is a, a high, a, an important limitation for pharmacies, at least in Spain, and also it has impact on the motivation of pharmacies to do this kind uh, of thing. And uh, the problem is even worse, at least in Spain, when the prescriptions came from a private doctor or a dentist. Uh, in these cases, pharmacist doesn't know anything at all about the patient. And uh, in definitely, I, I think this is a relevant barrier to the role of pharmacists in AMR, and in general for the provision of any other pharmaceutical professional pharmaceutical service in the community pharmacy, pharmacy setting. So uh, we should be able to solve this situation. And at the same, at the same time, it should also necessary, uh, be necessary to improve the relationship between prescribers and pharmacists. It should be not be difficult. There are some tools to do it, but the problem is that these tools are uh, uh, blocked for pharmacists. So I think thank you very much. Thank you, Elsa. Really good guidance. And just to say that the chat is exploding with such good ideas and thoughts. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to um, answer each one of them. But please be assured that the chat is going to be downloaded, and we will use it to inform the finalization and the refinement of the of the roadmap going forward. We have seven minutes, and I have to get through the conclusions. But I have just two questions that I would like the both of you to refer to. The first one re, uh, relates to the antibiotics available without prescription, even despite regulations and even in the, the, the very um, high income countries in Europe. What are your thoughts on that and how can we mitigate uh, um, prescription or, or pr provision without prescription? And then secondly, in, the, in terms of vaccination, there was quite a bit of, of uh, discussion around the fact that pharmacists are certainly capable, but they would be obstructed or challenged by other healthcare professionals, um, whereas in other countries like Norway and the UK, vaccination is allowed by pharmacists. So if I could let you in the next three minutes answer both those questions and then I'll go on to the conclusion. Please go ahead. Okay, um, so antibiotics without prescription. So Europe is probably ahead of the game in that uh, all countries have legislation in place that antibiotics should only be um, supplied uh, with a prescription for a prescriber. There has been quite a, a bit of uh, uh, publications out there showing that some countries um, um, there is almost uh, an expectation that at weekends, if doctors aren't open, that some community pharmacies are feeling pressured to supply antibiotics out there. I think there are two approaches to this. So the first one really is at a national level, which is around um, supporting those pharmacists to start saying no um, to those expectations. But at the same time, providing those pharmacists with the tools um, to the patient to say, actually, you don't need antibiotics um, by giving them appropriate information, which is supported by evidence to say antibiotics are unnecessary uh, in sinusitis, 
uh, most sore throats and things like that um, sort of out there. In addition, I think there needs to be perhaps from the regulators within those countries um, to be really sort of hard on that. And I think Elsa could probably um, describe what's happened in Spain, where I think they've been more successful um, on that. Elsa. Uh, yes, I think in, in Spain, pharmacies are quite aware about the problem of dispensing an antibiotic with high prescription, and also patients are aware of this. Uh, I don't know why, but in the last years, uh, okay, uh, I think uh, policies uh, focused on, uh, on uh, forbid, uh, forbidding dispensing antibiotics uh, without prescription has been um, implemented. And I think, uh, but uh, I think um, that the situation in Spain in this sense is quite, uh, quite good. People, uh, pharmacists are quite uh, aware of the risks of dispensing without prescription. I think the key point is, uh, is uh, give pharmacists arguments on how to educate and convince a patient with professional arguments that an antibiotic is not the solution in, in his case and that there are other options for the symptomatic treatment of his problem. So I'm going to... Uh, use the prerogative of the chair and ask that you to have one comment each, 30 seconds each to wrap up, and then I'll go on to the, the conclusion, please. Okay, so the, the final bit was just um, uh, very quickly about vaccination, which is one of the bits I'm really keen on. Um, I think there's some lots of good evidence out there um, which can prove that pharmacy can be vaccinators and it can be done safely and with good communication back to the family doctor uh, and I think we should use that evidence to get it rolled out across Europe. Excellent ideas from everybody um, and I hope we can look on your support. Thank you. Elsa, do you want to add 30 seconds of your input on vaccination? Uh, yes, uh, okay, I agree with, uh, with Philip, and I think this is an interesting uh, initiative that uh, we should uh, be able uh, to implement in, in our countries, in more or less, uh, depending on the available resources and the specific situation of this country, uh, we should make uh, some... Uh, um, Thank you. And just to say that FIP has a publication on the pharmacist's role in vaccinations. And I think somebody's put up the link on the chat. So what's our next steps then, if we could have the next slide. Um, so the initial, the, the obvious step is that we want to publish both the regional as well as the uh, global roadmaps. And the pharmacy week activities starting next week, the 21st of September. Uh, are going to see lots of AMR-related uh, initiatives as well. So those of you that attended the workshop on the 12th, Catherine uh, Garten, the, the uh, CEO of FIP, announced the FIP AMR commission and also made men and microbial stewardship. That is going to be, um, so this roadmap is going to be the very first deliverable of the AMR commission. Um, and the AMR Commission will be launched on the 24th of September at 1 p.m. Central European time. And I'd like all of you, I strongly urge all of you to participate and, and, and attend, please. Um, the next slide, please. Also related to the, to the next steps. Um, sorry. We have in this workshop, uh, as well as four workshops yesterday and one more today, identified key actions and engendered regional commitments to antimicrobial resistance action in pharmacy. The AMR roadmap is a living document. It is meant to be an iterative tool that will act as the compass to guide actions globally, sustaining momentum and evaluating progress in pharmacy, and will be revised annually, culminating in a presentation at the FIP World Congress in 2023. This is going to be in Cape Town, South Africa, so you're all very welcome, where a special health minister's summit will be hosted. Uh, we urge all of you to continue to engage with the roadmap, engage with the FIP AMR Commission, and we look forward to hearing your voices as we go forward in developing this further. And finally, um, 
sessions such as these would not be possible without uh, a number of people. So I would like to acknowledge Kathleen Duggan for advancing the AMR and AMS discourse uh, within FIP, Adrian Shepherd for his visionary leadership of GRIP, and then Jane, Erin, and Ashlyn from Cello Health and Corolla and Susanna from FIP and Mila from FIP for your invaluable support. Thank you to uh, 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 Phil and, and uh, Elsa, you, you were superb facilitators. And a very special thank you to all of the participants who made the time to be present today and to give us your invaluable inputs. The, the chat was really uh, informative and we will use all of these inputs as we move forward in developing the European as well as the global roadmaps. So thank you all very, very much. And I wish you a great day further. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye all.